Anyways, my name is Joshua Bennett. Welcome to the Farthest North Revolution Radio. If everybody's Alaska, I suppose there could be somebody out there farther north than us, but I highly doubt it. In the studio today, we got my good friend, Mike Anderson. Good morning, Mike. How are you doing today, bud? Doing good. Try that one more time. I'm doing good. And we have a very special guest today. One of the leaders in the revolution from the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, Executive Director, Mr. Daniel McAdams. Good morning, Daniel. Is he on there? Hello. I said I just heard him seconds ago. Hey there, Daniel. Hello. Hey, there we go. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm here. Yeah, we've got you. We're just a little... Uh, Ah, typical technical difficulties on this program. <laughs> well, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us again. It's always a real pleasure for us. Um, I love uh, any of your articles or interviews, and it's been, uh, boy, I guess uh, the last one that you had with uh, RT was particularly interesting. Um, obviously, we have some... You know, I guess it's kind of the most important thing to ever happen in the world. We have our elections on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been pretty interesting to me that so many people hate both people running for office. And yet, uh, I don't know, they still feel obligated that we have to vote for one or the other, which I don't necessarily agree with that. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you see with the... Not to speculate, but behind the scenes where it seems like we have, maybe for the first time, or at least um, the most obvious, a little struggle within the state itself. The deep state deciding who, who they want to actually win this time. Yeah, it's, it's almost it's dizzying, you know, the, the pace of the news this past week. And it, you know, some of the things you, you just wonder, they're so bizarre. I mean, yesterday was this whole business of, of Podesta and some weird satanic dinner, and it's just like uh, somehow the country has been given some hallucinogenic drugs or something. <laughs> it's just it's hard to follow. But the um, the issue of the FBI, you know, the announcement, the, the, the amazing announcement from James Comey uh, a week ago yesterday, really uh, opened things wide open. And there's been so much speculation, and and as and none of us really know exactly what was behind the reopening of the investigation into Hillary's emails. Um, but apparently, uh, it, you know, they have found additional emails on uh, Anthony Weiner's computer that he apparently has shared with his wife, who was Hillary's top aide. So um, it just blew the whole thing wide open. And, 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 you know, there's speculation as to whether, you know, some FBI officers, FBI agents, Furious that she wasn't uh, prosecuted in July, uh, have been you know have been you know sort of conspiring and leaking, and it's it's really hard to see exactly what's what, but something is definitely happening. I think we can agree on that. Have you seen? Any, um, I know you're a student of history, especially uh, political history. Have you seen anything like it before? I mean, in the past, it was. Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, I was thinking extent. that this morning. I was trying to remember previous elections, and if, if, if any, I mean, the most recent one, it's just been, uh, you know, depressing, right? Yeah. Uh, Obama <laughs> versus uh, versus Romney, and Obama versus McCain. You didn't want either of them to win, and 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 nobody was that awfully excited because the establishment was well represented. I don't think um, Obama was was. You know, he presented himself as someone different, and he was a fresh face because he was a relatively new senator. But the establishment already had, I think, its, it's hooks in him. So uh, certainly the, some aspects of this election I don't remember in my lifetime and probably go back to, you know, you know the, the 1964 with Goldwater and the um, assertions that he would start a war and that sort of thing. But I think this surpasses that uh, with, you know, the... Uh, the assertion from the Hillary camp and the overt assertion from Hillary's camp that, that Donald Trump is an agent 
of the Russian government. I think that <laughs> that has to be unprecedented. Yeah. You know, maybe it goes back to Eugene Debs or something at the beginning of the last century, but it really has to be unprecedented. Yeah, especially how, like you said, it's so overt. I mean, it's not like, you know, usually there's just little innuendos here and there, but this is flat out, yep, <laughs> Donald Trump <laughs> is working directly for Vladimir Putin, probably gets a little money under the side there. Like, he needs it. You know, he's only got $4 billion, and he might need a few extra here or there to work for Russia. It's just, it's it's stunning. It's uh, And it's crazy because it has gotten traction obviously in the mainstream media lots of traction which i guess anything that hillary wants them to have traction on they do get <laughs> what's, what's interesting is um I, I noticed a lot of people that i know on the on the left you know people that you follow in social media the, the liberal types uh you know the ones that 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 uh you know would criticize mccarthyism and would pretty uh, criticize the cold war criticize the red scare you look at their posts these days, and it's just—it's as if they've they've gone beyond, you know, the the John Birchers and seeing reds everywhere, <laughs> uh, you know, and Putin is infiltrating our 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 vital uh, our vital juices, and, you know, our vital bodily fluids, and it's 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 just it's, it's it's funny to watch them go insane because I don't think there's any other explanation for it that they've literally gone insane. Yeah, and I got into a little spat with an old friend of mine yesterday. Uh, who, who started going on about this, and I said, look, if you want to find some things to criticize Trump about, you know, l- let me get you started, because <laughs> get comfortable, I'll help you. Right. But this whole idea that he's somehow Putin's agent is just so absurd. Right. Yeah, let's, I mean, there's plenty of things we can beat him up with, with, uh, when, <laughs> with this, uh, not only will I kill the terrorists, I'll kill their families, too, and I'll have 20,000 ground troops, and, yeah. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. He's a nut job for the most part, but the, I've been having a hard time. I mean, I obviously prefer no president, and then, but you know, you still speculate in your mind. Hmm, which would be worse, Clinton or Trump? Trump, I have no idea, but Hillary, that lady's just flat out evil. Yeah, I mean, she's scary. <laughs> Maybe if she lived in uh, Fairbanks, where you know, not necessarily, but we can see them in our backyard, Russia in our backyard. Um, she wouldn't be so hot and heavy to start a hot war. I mean, <laughs> it's these, um, for for instance, when she talks about a no-fly zone in uh, Syria, could you, we've talked about it a little bit, but you're, you're a pro. What exactly would the implications, you think, would be if she becomes president well, and makes this no-fly zone in Syria? I, I think she knows that she can't do it unilaterally, and I think she she walked. I I, I sense that she walked it back a little bit at the final debate, uh, and uh, her, her wording was just subtly very different than it had been in the past, and and it made it sound like she was suggesting a voluntary no fly zone, because I think there has to there has to be at least one of the generals who are behind her who who are backing her. That said, you know, Secretary Clinton, let me let me explain this to you. <laughs> this would require us to take out um, the entire air defense of Syria, uh, including all of the Russian airplanes in Syria would have to be taken out uh, before anything like this could be declared. And as uh, as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs said uh, before Congress uh, just a couple of weeks ago, this would require war with Syria and Russia. Hmm. So I think I think it's known, and I suspect I'd go back and look at her words. But I remember listening to her, thinking, "Oh, she's trying to walk this back a little bit." Huh. Well, you would hope so. I mean, I I've never operated one or seen it really in real action, but it seems like the uh, Russians' S four hundred anti aircraft system is pretty bad to the bone. <laughs> and yeah, and it might actually work. Too, yeah, yeah, the S threes and four hundreds. Which the Syrians are operating the S three hundreds now. It's just, yeah. oh, I mean, it's just. I don't know when I've. Well, maybe because I'm not old enough, but I don't ever remember really um, such outright, blatant, you know, war thumping with Russia. Though I mean, it's uh, it scares people, and even when they bring it up, it's just like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. We'll take them. <laughs> 
and, and the, the question is over what? Yeah, That's right. A big issue. Uh, <laughs> you know, even the domino theory at the time, okay, you could buy into it. You know, you can't, you can't, you know, in retrospect, we know that it was a bunch of baloney. But at the time, with the Red Scare, you could buy into it. You know, if this domino falls and that and the other, next thing you know, we've all gone Connie. <laughs> but but this is World War Three threatened over what? Over who rules Syria? Right. You know, it's, it's talk about cheapening things. You know, the, the, do, the dollar's devalued by 90% since so the Fed was created. It seems like our brains have been devalued, too. <laughs> As the dollar goes, so does the American mind. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's pretty funny. But, you know, the news cycle drives a lot of this. And, and yeah. when you think of, talk about a lockstep media, it is incredible. Uh, the the uh, the mainstream media how they don't question anything coming out of Washington when it comes to Syria uh, the hypocrisy is is astonishing you know the, uh, the 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 Russian and Syrian attempts to liberate East Aleppo which the U S government itself admits is controlled by Al Qaeda that is somehow a massacre they're right. doing it just for fun yet the U S and the Iraqi attempt to lift the siege of Mosul that's being held by ISIS is a glorious liberation. Oh. And, and nobody in the mainstream media questions it. Yeah. And it's absolutely horrible. I mean, I've seen pictures of, uh, you can see the before and after pictures of some of these cities in Syria that were absolutely beautiful, and now they're just rubble. And I don't know, it just disgusts me, for, uh, makes me disgusted with Americans to let this, allow this to happen in the, and the media to allow it to happen with, without reporting what's really going on. I guess it's just whoever's, I don't know, maybe if Bush was the one in charge now, they'd be screaming war crimes and telling us about all the, the, the little kids that are getting limbs blown off. But I guess, I don't know, maybe it's not just because it's Obama or whatever, but it's, it's disgusting. The, the death and destruction over there is, is so sad. It's not even, you can't even put it in words. I mean, it, we're so far removed from what's going on over there it's just it's really bad sad <laughs> the ca- yeah the callousness of it you know the, the these families being destroyed and the Amer- american public doesn't seem to care it's, no. it's, you know it's it, it no wonder people they don't hate us for our freedoms <laughs> they hate us for that and you know I, I was just read the other day that the u.s unfortunately is giving a gift that keeps on giving which is that they've admitted that at least twice they've used depleted uranium in Syria. Oh, okay. And we all know what that did in Iraq, you know, yeah. the spike in uh, deformities and birth defects and these sorts of things. Still so, going uh, on. will be around for a long time. Still happening in places like Fallujah, where they're still having birth defects from it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, it's so funny when um, there's a natural disaster somewhere in the world, and... All these Americans pat themselves on the back because they'll send them $100 million in, in private funds, right? They'll raise a bunch of money and send it, and you think, well, Americans are pretty good-hearted in that area. And yet, <laughs> when it's the military destroying people, a man-made disaster, which has taken so many more lives, just, nah, eh, those brownies. It yeah. serves them right. They shouldn't have been born over there. <laughs> or is uh, the media, what the media is doesn't show it? No, I know it's, it just drives me nuts. Or what was uh, I don't remember who said it, but um, it's like, well, he shouldn't have uh, he shouldn't have been the son of. It was the American kid when he got killed. In the, oh yeah, well, he shouldn't have been I'll his son. Him, yeah, like what? <laughs> oh, it's so. Do you? Uh, Boy, I don't, I don't see anything good from a Hillary Clinton thing. I can't see anything good from a Trump election except for I don't know what he might actually do. But when you look at his um, the folks he brought on board with the Giuliani's, I mean, he's got he's gone. At least people he's brought on board to be part of his administration seem like they're just the, the same old warmongers as all of them were. No change there. Yeah, it's what um, it's what. It's what um, you know. Uh, uh, Obama's uh, not one of Obama's national security advisors, uh, Ben Rhodes, called the blob. You know, <laughs> this is the foreign policy establishment. It's it's, it's groupthink in Washington. Anyone who challenges the ideas 
of what our foreign policy should be just simply is ignored, uh, is on the outside. And so, unfortunately, when Trump looks around for, quote, experts on foreign policy, he has no option but to choose from the blob, uh, because otherwise uh, it would be uh, uh, these people, uh, people aren't considered experts right. if they're not part of the blob. Well, are, have you made sure that he has the phone number to the Ron Paul Institute just in case? <laughs> he needs to talk, happy to, to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to talk to some real foreign policy experts that actually have a brain that aren't you know, insane. Dr. Yeah. As Dr. Paul points out, you know, his foreign policy, and this is probably one of the, deep, the deepest flaws of, of, of Donald Trump, uh, and, and maybe his appeal, but his foreign policy, and of course his domestic policy to a degree, but it's not driven by a, a philosophy, it's not driven by a world view. Uh, you know, what is America's role in the world? What is the U.S. government's role in our lives? You know, these kinds of deeper questions that would inform someone who'd want to be, <coughs> excuse me, no, the leader of the free world, so to speak, um, if they don't seem to animate him, he doesn't seem interested in those. Right. And that's, that's what I think makes him most dangerous, is that you simply don't know what will happen next with him. Peace can be boring. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's what kind of glory is that? I mean, big generals and uh, ancient kings didn't. Well, I don't know. Maybe not ancient kings, but it's like there's that, not much glory in uh, a general living through peacetime. It was like that one general said uh, a couple of weeks ago. We need to we need to reward our defense contractors with a war. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's not fair, Mike. Come on, it's not fair that we're cutting back these programs and these poor billion dollar industries. Or, you know, they're having to eat lobster only four times a week now instead of six. <laughs> I can't expect them to live through that. I mean, good grief. Where's your heart, brother? Where's your heart? <laughs> that, and I think, a, a, sorry. I, I think a lot of this is the function of the decline of the legislative branch of government, too. Um, the, the, president, the president, if he's going to do something in, in terms of domestic policy, will have to fight with Congress. Uh, look at the fight over Obamacare, and, mm -hmm. and you know, of course, the Republicans will roll over things like prescription drugs, Medicare, and that sort of thing. But essentially, there will be a fight on domestic. But because Congress, because the legislative branch refuses to assert its constitutional uh, prerogatives when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to war making, the president will view that as the one part of his administration where he can actually do something and get things done. And so, it's a danger that we've sort of created ourselves by not forcing the legislative branch to stand up and do its constitutional job. Right, because that is, I mean, uh, I mean, if you study early constitutionalism or the Revolutionary War, you know, that was pretty set in stone. The president doesn't have the right to go, what was it, uh, John Quincy Adams seeking out these uh, dragons or whatever, the monsters overseas and everything. It's Congress's job because they're directly responsible to the people, or supposed to be, not that they very much are now, especially we don't vote. I mean, we have direct elections for senators and all these wonderful garbage mm -hmm. things now, but it's, ah, uh, I'm actually worried. I talked to some guys at work. Af after work, we are just sitting around, kind of chilling out before we went home and, and just discussing, well, I think, what was it, five more days, six more days or something. And we're like, yay. Uh, <laughs> and they were all, so we move into South America? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's so scary. I mean, Hillary Clinton, I think, is flat evil. And and uh, a couple of the guys were like, well, we could hope for Donald Trump. I said, yeah, but that guy, he's such, or seems, his his talk is so authoritarian. I'm afraid of a strong police state with him. I mean, he, you know, when he pounds on the desk and talks about law and order, sure, yeah. you and I believe in law, but not necessarily the kind that he's talking about <laughs> and that he's going yeah, to right that, that's a, the wrong. That's a good point. And that's what, you know, Dr. Paul said all along is that authoritarian instinct, you know, and it's, and, you know, he made the point back when he was running that it takes actually a lot more strength to restrain yourself when you want to act. Right. You know, to pull back, that takes a lot more strength than, to, as you say, to pound the table. Exactly. Absolutely. It's much easier, especially when you have the 
supposedly have the power, legitimate power to use it than to, I don't know, think outside the box. And You know, i got to say that's what I've been very, uh, if I can use the word, proud of the the Ron Paul Institute, um, Dr. Paul, who I've watched over the last year and a half just get pounded, pounded, because how come you're not supporting Trump? Why won't you support Trump? He's our best shot. I mean, whatever our best shot means. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I've uh, we talked about this a little bit, too. We, I could see where maybe um, he could get more support if he just jumped behind him. I, we've seen him on Fox News, all these other TV shows, and they say, well, you won't even support him? And he just says, no. And you know what? That's what I love. That's what I love about that man is that, and your institute, you guys are rock solid. We're not going to sway one way or the other. We're not going to give, I mean, evil's evil. You call it out the way it is, and there's no compromise with evil. There's no compromise with tyranny. There can't be. And we can see yeah. with the Libertarian Party now, whatever it is, I, I guess it's, yeah. It Well, the label says Libertarian Party. But, but I mean, we have the uh, vice president, well, you know, the nominee for them, well, all he does is go out and tell everyone how great Hillary is. And you have this Johnson who, when you ask him the most basic of Libertarian question, he says, huh? What's that? Well, I want to make sure them people bake cakes for the gays. <laughs> I mean, it's just, there's no, um, politically, there's no, I don't even think there's any way to support anything politically, but that's just a personal opinion. But um, I've been really proud. It is a shame. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I was just going to say it's a shame because this should have been the year for the LP to, Shine. I mean, there's so much attention on them. <clears throat> Uh, that it could have been their year, but they sure have blown it, and they're going to do a lot worse than the polls are suggesting, I think. Oh, I, I believe so, too. I mean, you can't be a, an idiot. The guy just comes off. I mean, some of my teenage boys, I would much rather have giving the interviews <laughs> because they would have been spot on the money, and people would be like, whoa, what is this libertarianism where this guy is just like no toast? It's terrible. And, and he, but, but when he does lose his temper, he's scary. I don't know if you see Johnson <laughs> when he gets picked off. But, I mean, he, he's my, sounds like Trump. He gets so yeah. uh, annoyed, and he yells at the reporters. And Yeah, wow. unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, I got to say, we're, uh, this year would have been the year for Dr. Paul, but at the same time, I sure am glad he's not running because I'd hate to put that on that guy. <laughs> that would be horrible. I'm much happier that he's doing what he's doing right now. Much seems to me much more important. <laughs> it, it is difficult though because you're right. Uh, you know, people do when you're running for something. People do pay a lot more attention. They still have the sense that if, if you're elected, you can change things. Right. And it, 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 it is difficult when you, you know, as Dr. Paul has always been in the business of education, but when you remove the the seat that you hold in government, people do. You know, it, it does make it. it it removes your, your megaphone to a degree, you know, so you, you have to work harder. And you're right, his, his position on principle this, this past couple of years of the campaign, or this past year, has, has you know, frankly, I think it, it has hurt us to a degree. But, yep. you know, the whole reason he created the, the Ron Paul Institute was to really uh, be the bulwark against um, uh, the, um, the in, encroachment in the, in, in the ideas of, of pure or non-interventionism. You know, right. and I think that's what we're going to see as interventionism fails. You're going to hear voices of moderate realism and these sorts of things. And you already see a few Beltway pseudo libertarian think tanks on foreign policy that talk about, um, well, we need to have the strongest military in the world, and we <laughs> need to, you know, guard our interests. We just don't need to enter every war. And you know, the, the realists can be tactical allies. I think the non-interventionists. But uh, at the end of the day, they still believe uh, the principle that the U.S. has the right to intervene overseas. Right. And uh, so it's, 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 it's um, uh, like in economics, you may have some, and I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, the supply siders, there are some, maybe some tactical areas of agreement with the, with the, um, the, the, the Austrians. Right. But essentially, they still are Keynesian. They still are Keynesian in their heart. Yeah. And that's the problem with, with, with realists. So so that's why we're going to hold the line. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, yeah, and you are, but it's uh, it's so important because uh, ideas, you know, and I, I've harped on this a lot, but ideas are what wins the battles. Um, when you look at, uh, oh shoot, what was it? John Adams, when asked about the uh, American Revolution, he said it, the war was won way before the shots were fired. The war was won with the uh, the change of the hearts and minds when people had a different attitude towards the king, towards religion, you know, breaking away from a state church and towards politics in general and had all of a sudden, which was pretty new at the time, this thought about being free people, individual freedom. That's when it was won. And I think that's the same thing that we still have to strive for today, which you guys have been daily, daily, daily harping on, which we have to. I mean, we get people that call in here all the time. Well, not so much lately because we kind of shut them down. But, you know, oh, you guys are crazy if you think anything's going to change without us going out there and killing everybody. It's like, well, <laughs> who are you going to kill? What? Well, you know, the those guys. You mean your neighbors? I mean, police officers? Police officers are your neighbors. I mean, t- yeah. we're talking about other Americans, other people with families. What This, this whole thing of just, we're just going to start a revolution and kill people. That's just crazy. It's craziness until... We change, I mean, because you just come up with another tyrant. Until people's yeah. hearts and minds are changed, that's that's our goal. It might take, you know, it, it might not be in your and I's lifetime or our children's, but maybe our grandkids will have a good shot at it, you know? And I think that's worth it. It's, yeah, it's worth I think, it. as Dr. Paul has said, you know, the, the, the politicians, the legislators, the government is sort of a trailing indicator of the prevailing um, uh, uh, the prevailing morality of the society. So I think our leaders reflect the moral decline of America. So, so uh, uh, some sort of a violent uprising, what have you, doesn't solve the kernel, the real problem. The problem is uh, that, that Americans, by and large, have adopted, in, in a moral sense, the idea that you can interfere and intervene in other people's lives, whether they be overseas, whether they be at home. And, 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 and so when you adopt this sort of violent attitude, that's really where the cancer is. I was, um, it reminded me of something that a friend sent me the other day when he said that it seems, uh, you know, the, the moral of the people, the morals of the society or whatever you want to call it is the politicians we end up with. And uh, it was a few weeks back, a friend of mine sent me this scripture from Daniel 4.17. And uh, it says that this word by decree of, of the des- observers, the matter is a command from the Holy One. This is so the living will know that the Most High is ruler over the kingdom of men. He gives it to anyone he wants and sets the lowliest of men over it. <laughs> like, ah, <laughs> how true is that? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you can be a freaking atheist and figure that one out and go, boy, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> the lowliest of the lowliest. Oh. I don't think I don't think it re- refers to humble. I think it's just the most destitute of them all, or the, the lowest despotic. Common, the lowest common denominator. Right. The yeah. worst rise to the top. Dan, yeah. did, have you? Maybe you can ease my mind here. Why? Okay, this election has been, it seems, not for someone, but voting against someone. Um, My wife was telling me about something she saw from a friend of hers that said, oh, I really don't want to do it. It pains me. It kills me, but I'm going to go vote. Why do we do that? (laughs) Why do we feel like we have to vote for someone to rule over us? Especially Americans. I have this... uh, it's getting deeper and deeper in the back of my head as time goes on, but I have this little thing in my mind where I think Americans can be individuals. Americans can rule themselves. And more and more, it's like, nah, not so much. Please rule over us. I mean, we feel like we have to. Is it just from media? Is it from being pounded in the public schools about our quote-unquote duty to vote? Is that why we ha- seem like we have to do it? I, I, don't, I just don't understand. If you hate the people you're voting for, why do it? Yeah, it's 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 a difficult 
it's a difficult thing to argue with people that talk about it being your your civic duty uh, to uh, to go vote. But you know, as you point out, when you when there really are no choices, uh, you know, I was thinking back this morning about about voting and trying to remember when I. I mean, I, I stopped voting a while ago because I, it didn't seem to make any sense. Um, you know, I was when I was quite a bit younger. And I wasn't that interested in ideas. I felt like the party was important. Yeah. But it doesn't. Um, it doesn't seem that way anymore. And I think maybe. Um, you know, I, I uh, watching what the party did to people like Pat Buchanan in the early '90s yeah. and how it, it just started. It, it, you got the sense that it's all. It's all fixed. It's all phony. Well, isn't it? I mean, you guys talk about the deep state all the time, and I, I don't know if people understand what that means. But I mean, the the. Uh is anyone that you see on TV actually in charge? Are any of them actually calling any of the shots? I mean, or is it the rich oligarchs in the background that have been calling the shots for years? I mean, because what, what has changed? Who cares, let's say the last 50 years, no matter who's been elected president, exactly what has changed in, let's say, foreign policy, domestic policy, um, currency policy, anything like that, monetary policy, I guess. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point about the deep the deep state, and you know it's 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 almost overused now. It's almost become cliche that we use it so much, but it is relevant and it is important because there is a permanent governing force in Washington. And my old friend Mike Lofton, who I who I knew on the Hill, he was a, he was a House uh, a House Budget staffer. Then he moved over to the Senate, and he's written about the deep state extensively. But he, he knows because he was actually a part of it in a way. You know, he was he was a pretty powerful uh, staffer who who nobody at the time had ever heard of, um, and he was powerful because he controlled the budgetary process for 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 defense. He didn't control it, but he was part of the machine, part of that machine that churned out the military budgets every year. And so he saw these people, and I certainly saw it when I was uh, working for Dr. Paul in the in the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, how it works and how these people, uh, they, they first of all, they have no loyalty to their boss because th- that next job, you never know where it's going to come from. They're, they'll stab their the, the elected official in the back in a, in a second if they think it'll help them. Right. <clears throat> but it's all about it's all about power and maintaining control, and that's that's the deep state. I certainly saw it in in the um, in the house, the people that, that do the intelligence budget and all this sort of thing. Well, I know it has. I remember the first time I actually heard the heard the word "deep state" and read an article about it. I thought, "Ooh, yeah, somebody's talking about it." All right, and yeah, now now it is used quite a lot. But at the same time, if you think about it, the I'd say our opposition or whatever, they've never ta- been so brazen before either. It's like Mike brought up earlier when um, I don't remember if it was. Joint Chiefs of Staff or whoever was saying, you know, we, we've got to give our buddies in the uh, defense industry a, a little boost here. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's – I remember being a teenager reading about Eisenhower talking about the military-industrial complex, and Kennedy talked about it. Now they just stand in front of Congress and say, hey, we got to help the military-industrial complex. Yeah, then you have the head, <laughs> the head of the Army uh, advocating, a, advocating a war with, that's bigger than World War Two. Yeah. So, yeah, so they they are brazen about it now. Yeah, so I think maybe the the reason we the word deep state so more banded around is because the deep state doesn't mind telling us that they're they're there anymore. It's not a secret anymore. I mean, they're so blatant and brazen. It's not, and that's kind of scary too, because even when they're so blatant, people still don't pick up on it. Mm-hmm. They still don't. Americans. They don't want to. They, they don't want to lose faith in the system. They don't want to believe that that. <laughs> It's as evil as it is. <laughs> well, I think you hit it right on the head. That I mean, we've been uh, maybe propagandized for so long about us being a uh, an elite nation, indispensable people and everything, and that our system of government is the best there ever could be and ever will be. Don't question it at all, which goes against everything about when they set up our system of government, of course, question. <laughs> I mean, the founders, and, yeah, every 20 years, kick it out and start over again. But and I, I think, I, I'm sorry. And I think we do. I mean, the three of us, uh, you know, 
we do love our country. I, I love America. Absolutely. I love the great things about America. <clears throat> you know, you're never, I, I lived overseas for a number of years, and you're never as patriotic as when you're away from the country. <laughs> but, um, you know, you remember so many of the fantastic things about America, even with its flaws, uh, how, how we can, you know, we can get things done. And, you know, that's just great thing. And that's why, I mean, I think that's why we hate our government, because we love our country. Right. That is such a good point. I mean, there has to be, and hopefully it comes around more, and maybe even these elections help it more, separation between what we see as our country and our government, because they're two separate things in my mind, in our minds. Yeah. Well, yeah, and there's also the kind of a traditional culture that, that we should be a people with without a ruler. Right. And, you know, my, my wife was showing me a comment that was made by, I think the person was in Brazil about the, the election, and, and this, this commenter was, was hoping America would elect Hillary because it's time for a woman ruler, <laughs> a, a ruler. For some reason, there is a need to have a ruler. Yep. And uh, that's, that's not part of the traditional American culture. And that's, that's something that's valuable. Uh, is, is, yeah. And now we see, do you, maybe this is a little bit deep here, but I've seen um, recently uh, Mr. Doug Casey um, John Whitehead's talked about it, both brilliant fellows, um, actually worried about from this election or the outset of this, you know, after the election, a literal civil war happening. And that's just terrifying to me that, that it could happen. But do you, I mean, they're both pretty smart guys <laughs> and they make a pretty good <laughs> yeah. case of why it could happen. And it just... I certainly hope it doesn't. But I mean, I think the best thing that could come out of the election, you know, I mean, this definitely, no matter who wins, the other side is not going to accept the result. Right. I think that's a given. And I was actually trying to, um, I was trying to remember when that might have been, and I think it was difficult in 2000 for the other side uh, to accept the results, you know, because it was pretty fishy. Yeah. But it didn't really result <laughs> in unrest. And I think uh, this time. Um, Anything short of unrest, is, I think, is a net gain for us because it means that people will, will lose their sense that the system as it stands is legitimate, yeah. uh, that the way these things are rigged is legitimate. They're going to get a sense that they're getting ripped off by the elites, and I think that is a, that can be the real silver lining in a pretty crazy cloud. Well, I think it's been great that the, like the Bernie Sanders supporters have found out flat out they got mm -hmm. ripped. <laughs> <laughs> the, the biggest believers in government. They right. Got, <laughs> Maybe they got their just dessert. I don't know. <laughs> well, we've had you on quite a while, and I sure appreciate your time. But uh, before we go, um, give us an, an update on the Institute. And, of course, uh, again, folks, if you just tuned in, this is um, Mr. Daniel McAdams, the executive director of the Ron Paul Institute, which um, we're great supporters of. I think we need... Oh my goodness! If you've seen any of the debates, whether you could get through it sober or not, the uh, <laughs> we need the Ron Paul Institute. You guys have been doing great work. But if you can give us a little update, I think uh, the other day I heard something about you guys are up to eight million views. Or and has it really been three years? Uh, well, we've been in existence about three and a half years, actually. That's hard to and, believe. Um, we, uh, we had we, we, we had a great year this year in terms of what we've been doing you know we had a big conference in uh, in Washington DC and Joshua you were you were part of it uh, you were a supporter of the conference and we really really appreciate your support but yeah. we had a we had a full house yeah that's and awesome. it, I, it, symbolically I think it was important to take our message uh, to Washington DC uh, a lot of people didn't don't like to go there certainly I kind of had to drag Dr. Paul out there. He didn't want to go. <laughs> but I think it's symbolically important, important to stand there with all the so-called experts. And we had people like Jacob Hornberger and Phil Giraldi, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, people that have been a part of it, people that have been doing this for years and years, and, and just make the case without compromise for a non-interventionist foreign policy, for getting out of these wars, for bringing the troops home. And it was so powerful to look out over the, the audience and see all of these people there, you know, mm -hmm. because Dr. Paul and I, you know, we do our Daily Liberty Report, and um, it, it can feel isolated because you're, you're here <laughs> in the studio, you're looking at a camera, you know, and, and 
and, and you don't know if you're reaching people, but when we got to Washington, we started talking to people, and so many of them watched the show daily. Yeah. They watched the Liberty Report, and they were appreciated, and it, and so it felt great. And I think, you know, it was broadcast on C-SPAN, so, so potentially millions of people saw what we did at this little conference. That was so, uh, so awesome. Sorry to interrupt you, but when C-SPAN, I was just so, I was thrilled. I could not believe they did that. That was great. I was, I was grateful. I, I, I called them a few times and I sent them emails with a detailed description of why this is so important and why they should cover it. And I never, I never heard from them. And never, at the very last day, they called and said, uh, we're sending a crew over. We need to answer all, a, a, answer all these questions. And <laughs> That's awesome. So, it was um, it was it was terrific, and you know we, Dr. Paul and myself and my colleague Adam, you know we're on the media, we're talking, you know we're, we're whoever, whoever asks us, uh, we'll go and, and we'll talk about these issues, and you know we we um, we have to make the case, we have to break through the propaganda, and it has been a very difficult year for us. Uh, people don't want to hear what we're selling, they don't want to hear what we have to say, uh, but it's you know. They need it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I and you know I can't express enough gratitude to uh, you and Adam have been so gracious to our show. I mean, there's much much bigger mediums out there, and we're just this little. I mean, we're up in the frozen. Our, our rivers are frozen, right? We're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I, and I saw the picture you sent. I loved it. <laughs> and yet, you guys have given, been so gracious to us. We really appreciate that. And um, even, you know, I'd, I'd link as much as possible um, links to the Ron Paul Institute or to um, the Liberty Report website. Um, people can go to our website or I'm sure they can still find it on the Ron Paul Institute website of the conference that happened last um, September, which ah, I wanted to go so bad. It still hurts my feelings, but I couldn't go. But at least it happened. Well, we we, we, at hope, least to, we it happened. hope to do it again soon. So we're, we're certainly planning to do it again. And Me too. Right here you know, or right down the road in Anchorage. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Oh, hey, let's, yeah. let's hope the stars align. Yeah, I really do. It'd be, uh, I really think it would be such a fantastic opportunity in a state, which I think maybe more than any state right now because of uh, some of the shenanigans our governor's done lately and everything – is really ripe to hear and plus i mean there's just no doubt about it we do live next door to russia and yeah. we're just a hop skip and a missile away from getting i mean if they if it came down to it a nuke mm-hmm. that's not very exciting not very exciting no. at all my brother god bless him called me the other day and goes hey i was just reading this whole thing so he gave me the let's see ground zero to 30 mile out what happens to you from a nuke i <laughs> said so, well that makes me feel good, brother. Thanks for the, the information there. It, yeah, we don't need that. And that's I think that's scary. That's why we need the, the Ron Paul Institute and the work you guys are doing to bring some common sense to um, the forefront. And with all the garbage that's going on, we need somebody, people like you guys that are sane, that actually know about foreign policy and peace and prosperity which is so important. I mean, with peace does come prosperity. And what we're dealing with now is just, I mean, so the opposite is true too. War, it's destruction. It's destroying our economy. You can't stand Except it. for the elite. Right. The elite will do well. They'll be the last to suffer. <laughs> you know, you go inside the beltway and everyone is living very large, very nice. I don't. You know, you get a little, sh- a little shack for half a million dollars, you know. <laughs> People are living very, very well off of the rest of us off of our hard labor they live off it and they live well that can't be expressed enough either i don't think people realize i mean when they rip off yeah it is a yeah flat rip off every time i have to pay my taxes it boils my blood because you know we got a a a great article if i could just say that we have up on the on the our website now ronpaulinstitute.org and it's written by an old friend of mine chuck finney who spent his whole career in the pentagon and, it, and I would urge anyone to, to, to read it because it's such a great synopsis of how Washington works, how the defense establishment works. And it's all about the so-called modernization of our nuclear weapons, oh. uh, this trillion-dollar project. And he goes down, you know, first of all, you have to make sure that, it, that it, it, many congressional districts as possible get a piece of the pie and everything. It's just a great article, and Chuck, it's such a great 
writer and great communicator. You know, I think in, in, in a nutshell, that's a, that's a great piece for an intro on how these guys work. Yep. <laughs> and it's, I got an email from, uh, sorry to say, my wonderful grandmother. Just the other day, and it was a chain email about how um, Russia is building up their nuclear missile systems, and and ours is just depleted. I mean, we only have like <laughs> three thousand nukes left. And I wrote her back, and I said, "Grandma, please don't just quit sending these to people. How many nuclear <laughs> missiles do we need to destroy the world?" <laughs> Take it easy, Grandma. Take it easy. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> Lady, bake some cookies. Do something. <laughs> Quit the propaganda. Oh, now you're in trouble. Now you're not going to get a Christmas present. No, I know. <laughs> Hopefully she's not listening today. <laughs> I'll find out in about three hours from now. <laughs> but you can't blame her. The propaganda is yep. so, it's so you know deafening. You know the poor lady. You know, and 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 it's just terrible. Well, and she lived through the depression. She lived through. World War Two. She and uh, my grand, her husband, was you know in World War Two for four years wow. in the Pacific. Wow. So and I, you know, we've talked about stuff like that, and I understand their feelings um, through that, which is kind of neat now. Is my grandpa's so anti-war? It's fantastic. When I was a kid, he used wow. to tell me, "If you ever join the military, join the Navy." Now, the last time I saw him, he lives in California, and I've got these four boys now, as you know. And he said, you better not ever let them join the military, boy. <laughs> I said, no, sir, I don't think there's any uh, worry about that. There's no worry about that. They love their country. They would, uh, I think, fight to defend their country, but they definitely won't be joining to go uh, having extracurricular, like act- Martin. <laughs> right, extracurricular activities over there. So, anyways, Daniel, I guess we can let you go. Thank you so much. And I do want to emphasize, folks, go to ronpaulinstitute.org. Support, support, support. This is one. I mean, quit giving your money to these idiot politicians. Just stop. You're killing yourself. You're paying for your own enslavement. Help people out that are trying to get us free again. That's seriously. Um I guess I don't know how else to put it. You guys are great. We really love you guys. We support you. We pray for you, and uh, try to find everything about what you guys are doing out there. As far as articles and interviews, it's it's fantastic. We really well, thank you very much. It. I'm so grateful uh, to you for your support and all your listeners as well. Thanks for having me on. You bet, sir. Get out there and. Uh, I'm, I want to see some pictures of this hillbilly heater, too, because this has me fascinated. <laughs> if it works, if not, I, I won't talk about it again. Oh, <laughs> come on. At least. <laughs> Maybe I'll have some ideas if it doesn't. Uh, that's great. All right. Well, take care, Daniel, and give our best right. to, the, to the folks you're working with, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll talk to you soon. Maybe after the election, there'll be some really interesting stuff to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Hopefully not a war, but all right. Oh God, no. Okay. <laughs> Have a good Take weekend. Care, guys. Great talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. And that was Mr. Daniel McAdams, again, the executive director of the Ron Paul Institute. Wonderful man. Brilliant man.